those who lived in the land of deep darkness, by sound of light song. Jesus Christ, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Good morning. How good it is to see you all here for one of our third, third Advent worship service at Unity Presbyterian Church. A couple of announcements for this morning are, we continue our Advent journey today. We'll be lighting our candles of love, hope, and joy. And as each week goes by, more and more light will enter as we make our preparations for the Lord long awaited birth. Don't forget, this is the final day to bring your items for the deacon's mitten tree mission to provide hats, mittens, scarves, and gloves to those in our community in need. That red plastic tote is out on our porch for you to leave these items in. Then our deacons will collect and distribute them. We have a special treat this morning. Our young folks have been learning to sign the words of this little light of mine and we are pleased to include their contribution to our theme of light in today's service. If you like to sing along with them, the video will be played a second time as our coming out to serve music pro prolude at the end of the service and the words are printed in your bulletin. Let us worship together. This third week of Advent, we turn to the writings of the Gospel writer Luke. He writes in two parts, the first being the Gospel biography of the life of Jesus Christ, and then the second, the Acts of the Apostles, the life of the early church, the first Jesus community. Whether you were a Jew or a Gentile in those days, deciding to become a Christian as part of this illegal early Christian movement could bring punishment for your allegiance. The message in both Luke and in Isaiah the prophet is a message to the downcast, the lowly and the oppressed, a message which rises up to bring welcome and inspiration. Like the Jewish exiled people of Isaiah's time and the early Christians, we also sometimes wonder where God is during our times of suffering. We long to hear the words of promise, a reason for joyful praise. Good news of Jesus Christ is on the way. says all is lost says, all is love. the darkness says the light is dying the light says the fire is catching fear says cover your eyes and your ears hope says wait watch and listen as we light our third advent candle we pray for the holy joy of god 
Come now, O child of Mary. Come now, O Princess Today, we light the third Advent candle, the candle of joy. We celebrate the joy which is ours with the coming of Jesus into our world and our lives. You are invited at home to light your Advent candles at this time. one, we thank you for the glimpses we catch of your gift of the depths of joy, even in the midst of fear, of challenge, of struggle, even when we are not sure of your presence, ignite the flame of joy within us. That we might glow with its brilliance from that place deep inside.
in this holiest of seasons. In our heart of hearts, we know that we have been unholy. Let us speak the truth about ourselves as together we confess our sin. Let us pray. Your love is good news for the oppressed, O Lord, and you bind up the broken heart. Forgive us, O God, when we think that your good news is only for us. Forgive us, O God, when we twist your gospel into something that fits comfortably into our lives. By your light, let us see you leading us beyond ourselves and into the world you love. By your grace, Forgive us our sin, and free us to try again. Amen. Arise, shine, your light is come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall come in the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. By the, By the mercies, mercies of Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Having received the mercies of Christ and that peace which passes all understanding, now let us pass his peace to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And in every way, in every day. Take time reach out to others and share with them this greeting. The peace of Christ be with you. Uh, I hear it. This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine strength by the power of your spirit prepare the way in our hearts for the coming of your word so that we may see the glorious signs of your promise fulfilled through Jesus Christ our Lord a voice, a voice is crying, crying in the wilderness, wilderness. Listen, listen to, to the, the word, word of the Lord, of the Lord. Amen. Amen the first reading is Isaiah 57 14 to 19 it shall be said build up build up 
prepare the way. Remove every obstruction from my people's way. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with those who are contrite and humble in spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. For I will not continually accuse, nor will I always be angry. For then the spirits will grow faint before me, even the souls that I have made. Because of their wicked wordiness, I was angry. I struck them. I hid and was angry. But they kept turning back to their own ways. I have seen their ways, but I will heal them. I will lead them and repay them with comfort creating for their mourners the fruits of the lips. Peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading comes from Luke in the first chapter, beginning at the first verse and then picking up again at the 26th verse. Listen again for the word of God. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who were from the beginning, eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided after investigating everything carefully from the very first to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting that might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me? that the mother of my Lord comes to me, for as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb left for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. 
His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her for about three months and then returned to her home. Heaven and earth will pass away. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The other night I watched again the wonderful movie, Unbroken. I know many of you as well have seen this movie, or perhaps you read Laura Hildebrand's best-selling book upon which the movie is based. Her book entitled Unbroken, a World War II story of survival, resilience, and redemption. But the movie and the book upon which it is based tell the true story of the U.S. Olympic long-distance runner, Louis Zamperini. Louis was also a bombardier in the Army Air Corps in World War II, flying in a B-24 Liberator. Louis survived for 47 days in a raft after his plane crash-landed in the Pacific. After 47 days, he was rescued, but also captured by Japanese sailors and sent to a series of prisoner of war camps. The most inspiring scene of the movie for me is when Louis and the others are forced to move to another prison camp. And here, Louis discovers that his torturer at a previous camp a Japanese soldier named Watanabe, whom the prisoners nicknamed the Bird, is again in command of the camp where he supervises the prisoners as they work loading coal barges. Louis pauses in his work, and he is punished by the Bird, who makes him lift a heavy beam the size of a railroad tie and hold it over his head. And the bird orders the soldier guarding Louis to shoot him if he drops the beam. Staggering under this heavy load above his head, Louis successfully holds this massive beam despite his exhaustion. He does this for a very long time, what seems to be hours. This enranges his tormentor, the bird, and he stares his Japanese captor in the eye. A story of survival, resilience, and redemption captured in that single scene where Louis carries a heavy burden. Many of us carry heavy burdens. Look into the faces of your fellow shoppers next time you're at the supermarket. There is a backstory. There is always a backstory. The dab results just came back. And she learned that she has cancer. He just received word that he is losing his job because his employer is going out of business because of the coronavirus. They just scheduled an appointment with the psychologist for their teenager who has fallen into depression during the COVID shutdown of in-school learning. 
she is food shopping. Between her two jobs, struggling to make ends meet as she tries to support her two children. She has just learned his child has a major learning disability. They just learned that their 20-something son is addicted to drugs. There is a backstory. There is always a backstory. And each of us, at some time or another in life, carries heavy burdens. This past year, many of us have carried heavy burdens due to the coronavirus. But we have also been reawakened to the burdens borne by those who are victims of prejudice. Yes, patterns of racism and poverty are woven into the fabric of our society. And the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, it has reduced many to poverty. Many who previously were taking donations to the food bank are now standing in long lines waiting at the food bank to get food. We are learning that poverty is not so far off after all. And good, hard-working people can fall under its grinding heel. There is always a backstory, and many of us carry heavy burdens. But Jesus invites, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The people of Israel carried a heavy burden as well during their Babylonian captivity. Exiled from the home they loved in the far off land of Babylon, a thousand miles away, their hearts were burdened, their spirits were set. While we have been exiled to our home during the COVID pandemic, they were exiled from their homes. And now, in the second portion of Isaiah's prophecy, he is speaking words of comfort and hope, promise and fulfillment, and Isaiah prophesies, rebuild, rebuild. He says to the people of Israel, build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. I dwell in the most high and holy place, and also those who are contrite and humble of spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. I have seen their ways, and I will heal them. I will lead them and repay them with comfort, peace. Peace to the far and the near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. Rebuild, rebuild, Isaiah says. And surely when the people returned from their captivity to Jerusalem, they found that the walls of the city and the walls of the temple had been destroyed and now lay in rubble. And Nehemiah, it is recorded in the book of Nehemiah, called to the people and said, let us rise up and build. and I and the world around us will rise up and rebuild when the coronavirus pandemic is over. The message Isaiah shares is that yielding to the holy means bearing our burdens, living with faith and hope in the living and loving God. Luke's gospel message, and the word gospel itself means good news from the Greek word oigelion, also echoes this theme of hope in the midst of suffering. In the days when a young virgin named Mary, betrothed to Joseph of the house of David, received a holy visitation from the angel Gabriel, they too were people who bore heavy burdens. 
They were people living in a land occupied by their Roman oppressors. But even in the darkest of times, God goes with us, whether through pro prophetic proclamation or angelic visitation, God goes with us, God comes alongside us, God helps us bear our burdens. And so the angel Gabriel greets this young woman. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. And Mary, pondering what this holy visitation could possibly mean, was anxious and uncertain. And the angel, seeing her uncertainty, comforted her, offering these words of assurance. Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary didn't get it. She couldn't understand the miracles of God. She exclaimed, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel responded, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and therefore the child to be born will be holy. So often in our Christmas celebrations, we think of Mary, the mother of the Son of God, as a meek and mild woman. But her response to the angel Gabriel tells us that she is more fierce than frail, more faithful than faulty. She responds, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Let it be to me according to your word. Even in the midst of suffering and their particular backstory, having to travel from their home to Bethlehem because some far off Caesar. Caesar Augustus declared that there must be a census, having to make that long journey while bearing a child. It would have been an arduous journey for anyone, but especially for those who are poor. She was not frail. She was fierce. And it was in that setting and in the larger context of the world of the Roman oppressor hypocrisy and self-righteousness of religious leaders that she made her way, faithful to her word, to be a handmaid of the Lord. In every age, there have been people who have been faithful even in the midst of the deepest suffering. We're going to close our Advent worship this morning with the hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. And the backstory to this beloved hymn is that it finds its foundation in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And to the Ninth Symphony were applied words from the German poet Frederick Schiller, which became our hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. You know, the symphony and how it goes. It starts with deep brooding tones in a minor key, reflecting the minor key in which our lives are too often lived, the burdens we bear, the suffering we endure, the pain we experience. And then, then, the music begins slowly, quietly to move to a major key. And the first spoken words in German are nicht mehr dieser Tone, 
which means in English, no more these tones. No more of these dark, somber, brooding, painful tones. And now the symphony erupts in a major key with what we call the Ode to Joy. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. What music lovers know is that Beethoven composed this beloved symphony in 1824 toward the end of his life. Frankly, he was a man who had little to be thankful for. He was sick, alienated from almost everyone, as is often the case with temperamental artists. And he had become completely deaf. Can you imagine that? The composer of the Ninth Symphony, arguably one of the finest symphonies ever known to humankind, composed it while he was deaf. Beethoven had never managed to find love nor create the family he so longed for and alone in his own place of suffering, he was able to write such a beautiful symphony, an anthem of joy which embraces the transcendence of joy and the beauty over suffering. Celebrated to this day for its ability to heal, to repair, and to bring people together across great divides, you would be amazed to learn how the Ninth Symphony has become an anthem of liberation and hope around the world. In 1989, in Tiananmen Square, students played the Ninth Symphony over loudspeakers as the army with its tanks came to crush their struggle for freedom. In Chile, Women living under the Pinochet dictatorship sang the Ninth Symphony at torture prisons where men inside took coat when they heard their voices sing. At the Berlin Wall in December 1989, when it was finally torn down, it collapsed to the sound of Leonard Bernstein conducting Beethoven's Ninth as the Ode to Freedom. And in Japan, each December, the Ninth Symphony is performed hundreds of times, often with 10,000 voices or more in the chorus in the aftermath of the earthquake and tsunami of 2011. Yielding to the holy means singing even during our suffering as Mary sang the Magnificat to her cousin Elizabeth, bearing the hope, which is the word made flesh. May we too yield to the holy and sing for joy. Amen.
Holy God, whose steadfast love is from everlasting to everlasting, we give thanks for the prophetic proclamation of Isaiah and the angelic visitation of Gabriel. For they both announce your presence in our midst, your readiness to love us no matter what, to bear our burdens, to bring us hope and healing. Thank you for being with us during this time of corona pandemic, a time when we are exiled to our homes, separated from those we love, constrained from activities which give life its joy and meaning, routines which help us to order our days and our weeks, our months and our years. Help us during this time which seems to pass so slowly to stay our minds on eternal things and to live with you in this moment to remember the past with thanksgiving, to look toward the future with hope, but to seek your presence in this very place, in this very moment, to know your peace, your comfort, your healing, your promise. For you have sent a son to be our savior, to redeem us from all that drags us down or holds us back, to save us from our sin and all that separates us from you and one another, to restore us to our worth as your children, created in your image to love and serve you and one another for all our days. As we each bear our own particular burdens, may we take inspiration in Isaiah's words of promise to rebuild, to regather, to heal. And may ours be the faithfulness of a simple peasant woman called Mary, who exclaims, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it to me according to your word. Help us to yield to the holy even in the most difficult of times. Help us to be harbingers of hope for others who live in the darkness of despair and despondency. Those who live with prejudice and discrimination those who live in poverty and cannot find a way out or a way up. May we be that shaft of sunlight that breaks through the clouds and brings people reason to smile, reason to hope, a flicker of joy. On this Advent Sunday, when we light the candle of joy, we celebrate your enduring presence and the joy that brings us even in the darkest of times. With men and women, these things are impossible. But with you, all things are possible, and so we turn to you in prayer. Watch over us and help us watch over one another and give us your strength as we come to you saying the words which Jesus taught us to say, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Now go into the world in peace, have courage, hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor the false love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of his spirit. Yield to the holy and sing for joy at the birth of our Savior. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, be with us and abide with us and God's children everywhere, now and in the life to come. And all God's children said, Amen. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna 